hello friends so today i'll be talking on this 56 covid 19 update on 4th december so i have stopped all the update on 54 so never knew that i may have to continue these updates until this omicron came so this update will be on omicron uh, what is the scientific uh, uh, literature that is available at this point of time there's not much so i'm sure all the viewers if you do google and search there's not much of scientific literature that you would get on uh, the details of this Omicron. So I've tried to look into multiple sources and try to tease out what is the most relevant scientific material that is available amidst all the sort of a media frenzy that is happening on uh, disseminating information on this Omicron. So it is very prudent. Scientific community has the right knowledge on this Omicron and uh, and 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 sort of disseminate the right message even to the public so this is the intent of this video so when you look at the, all the other variants that have come so far so we had the predominantly we had a alpha variant beta variant and you have a delta variant so if you look at the spikes of this variant this is how it looks so now we are in december uh, so november 24th was the first uh, omicron that was identified uh, so now we are in this Delta strain. So for all the global sort of a uh, awareness uh, or from the global perspective, the Omicron is the fourth wave. Uh, so in India, I think the fourth wave is a bit blurred. So in India, we are very much uh, clear about the second wave uh, because the third wave is by the Delta globally. So India also had Delta and Delta Plus, but we didn't see it distinctly as a wave. So for, from the global perspective, the Omicron constitutes the fourth wave actually. But for India, if Omicron cases significantly increase, it will be possibly looked at as a third wave. I think that is what we could deduce. So the reason why we are talking about Omicron and why it has caught on the eyes of the whole uh, global uh, sort of a attention is the acute rise in the number of cases. So it started off with 200 to 300 in the mid November, but in last one week, there have been more than 8,500 cases per week, and it has rapidly spread to around uh, 25 countries within a span of a week. So that has been the main reason why it has become alarming and concerned. So as I said, the first patient actually on the 11th November from the Botswana, they identified uh, this Omicron. But officially, it was released uh, you know, on 24th November 2021 from a patient from South Africa. So this patient, the onset of symptoms was from 9th November. And then obviously, they would have got an RT-PCR and then genetic sequencing was done. And officially, by the time it was released uh, as Omicron, uh, after having ascertained the genomic sequencing, it was 24th November 2021. And as I said, the first case came from Botswana on 11th, and the official sort of a confirmation of it from South Africa came on 24th November 2021. And after this, in last one week, so today is 4th December, so in last one week, the 23 countries have reported occurrence of uh, Omicron virus. And if you look at the list of countries, I've just included a few of the countries. So these are the list of cases as of 3rd December. Uh, so, Australia, so these are the countries which has reported uh, Omicron cases over last one week. So India has reported two cases from Bengaluru on 2nd December. So, so that is where our whole attention has been and our whole enthusiasm or our whole uh, fright has been on to understand about this virus. So what is this whole Omicron about? So as we all know, friends, uh, so every virus undergoes a lot of mutations. So, and the mutations for this Omicron, so you have all these nice spikes, as you see these uh, red ones, they're all the spike proteins. So if you look at the spike protein, it looks something like this in individual, but if you magnify it and look at it into electron microscopy, uh, it looks like this. So they have multiple sort of arrangement of uh, chromosomes and uh, genetic material or the genes in which all this mutation happens. So this is how the spike happens. And this balloon or parachute shaped one is called receptor binding protein is present on this. So there is, so the reason why this has caught on with a lot of uh, attention is because of the number of mutations this Omicron has undergone on this whole spike protein. So these are all the genes that are embedded in this uh, spike protein. So it has undergone 30 mutations. 
and 15 mutations are present in this receptor binding protein. So here, and all the genes that you see here have undergone other 15 mutations. So I will just take you through the genetic sort of a mutations that it has undergone. So as you see, you, we have had an alpha variant, which is called B.1.1.7. Then we've had a beta variant. The most recent one, we had a delta variant, which is called B.1.617. So this is the sort of a structural, uh, uh, this is the structure of uh, spike protein. Uh, and uh, they have tried to sequence the gene, uh, genomic sequencing of this spike protein. And they've looked at, they've, they've deciphered all the mutations that have occurred. So I will take you through, so the red ones are insertions and deletions in the gene and the blue ones are the mutations that have happened. So we'll start by, as you see, there are six areas which, uh, which the spike protein in the six areas which has undergone mutations, deletions and insertions. So we'll start by one by one. So this is just a schematic representation of the gene. So in the area one, so the mutations have happened in these, in these sort of a genes. So you can just look at those numbers. And what it means clinically is these mutations in these four genes lead to antibody evasion. So that is of a concern in this particular Omicron because your antibody response, your body mounts is evaded uh, by the mutations in these genes. So that is what is of clinical relevance of this. And as I said, there are 30 mutations in spike protein. And we'll come to the second area. So this is also of importance where there are deletion of the genes that has happened at 69 and 70 genes. And what this means is the, uh, so th there are certain RT-PCR tests uh, which could possibly identify this Omicron without doing genomic sequencing because of these deletions that have happened. So that is the sort of a relevance because some of the RT-PCR case, they look at, uh, you know, so all the other A, B and other genes. So if there is a, these genes which are deleted, it does not pick up. So that would imply that this patient possibly has an Omicron. So the utility of this deletion means some of the RT-PCR kits by method of exclusion can identify Omicron. So then, so the other important uh, aspect that has happened is in the area three. So area three, there is this predominantly this S gene, so which is 371. So these are the numbers. So there is a S gene dropout or S gene target failure that happens. So this is also of uh, relevance uh, with Omicron. And this leads to uh, creating obstacles for the antibodies to be effective against the spike. So you see these mutations have helped in evading the antibody response and they create obstacles for the antibodies. So, so that possibly puts a thought in one's mind that this may also lead to more infections. Okay. So then we go to uh, fourth area. Uh, these are the mutations that occur in the area four. Uh, and this happens at the furin cleavage site. And this furin cleavage site mutations that happen at the area four is responsible for increased transmissibility. So I'm sure all the viewers would have heard that the reason why it is labeled as virus of concern, Omicron, is due to increased transmissibility. And that increased transmissibility happens due to the mutations in this area four. And these are the genes that undergo mutations. And, and this happens at the furin cleavage site. And then we look at the five. So this the genes present in the area five is not on the spike protein. And here there, are, there is a lot of deletions of the genes that happen in this area five. And these are the genes that get deleted. And this deletion of these genes lead to immune evasion. So as you saw, there are three mutations and deletions that happen, which leads to antibody evasion, obstacle to the antibodies, and immune evasion. And there are certain gene mutations that increase the transmissibility. So these are the characterization of the uh, genetic mutations that has happened in Omicron, which makes it virus of concern. So that is what, from the scientific perspective, we understand. Then you have this receptor binding domain. I said that there are 15 mutations in the receptor binding domain, and this receptor binding domain is the one which binds to the ACA2 receptors or ACA receptors present on the cells. And this undergoes 15 mutations. So overall, 30 mutations have been recognized or have been expressed in Omicron virus. So the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, based on these mutations, so they suggest that prior infection to COVID does not make someone immune to Omicron. So even if someone has had a prior infection, 
it does not mean they have protection against Omicron. So that is what has been implied based on all the mutations and deletions that has happened. And it is also mentioned that for us to ascertain, so right now we know that this virus has increased transmissibility because of its spread in 23 or 25 countries in a very short period of time. And, and, uh, and as per uh, Professor Anne von Gottberg from uh, NICD, it would possibly take three to four weeks to determine whether this virus is really virulent or, or has increased severity because it would take that much time for us to recognize patients having increased hospital admissions and deaths. Because immediately when there is infection, you wouldn't know the severity because you wouldn't be able to ascertain the hospitalization and the death rate. So this is what uh, NICD has suggested. So now coming to the uh, backdrop of Omicron. So any viruses, we know they undergo a lot of mutations. So when they undergo mutations, they classify as variant of interest and variant of concern. So variant of concern is where there is increased transmission or where it is causing severe disease or increased virulence or the vaccine effectiveness is very less. So, uh, so the previous wave, the third wave globally was caused by this Delta variant, and that was classified as variant of concern. The reason why it was classified as variant of concern was it had a higher viral load and, it, and the infections uh, lasted for much longer and there were higher rates of reinfection. And virus of concerns, uh, the, the virulence or the effect uh, was mitigated by effective vaccination and by good public health measures. So even though it is a variant of concern, so what proved to be effective for even Delta virus was vaccination along with public health measures, avoiding crowds, avoiding close spaces, social distancing, masking, and vaccination. So there is emphasis that vaccination did help in reducing the severity and hospitalizations and death even in the Delta variant. We looked into the data for that. So what is of concern with Omicron is, see, as you see, the first wave, we know the doubling time was 1.3 days. The second wave, which is caused by beta, the doubling time was 1.7 days. The third wave caused by Delta was 1.5. But in Omicron, the doubling time is very less. As you see, it's only 1.2 days. And you see the huge spike here. Uh, the fourth wave caused in South Africa and other African nations. So that has become a matter of concern because the doubling rate is happening in a much faster rate. And the transmissibility also being high could possibly lead to more infections. And spreading of this infection can be more rampant. So this is what we have understood, at, at least until now. And what, does, what did we understand by all the deletions and mutations that has been identified in Omicron? These deletions and mutations can possibly lead to increased transmissibility and it can lead to increased viral binding to the host cells. And what, what is of concern for clinicians like us is higher antibody escape because we saw certain deletions and mutations which will evade the antibodies and which can create obstacles to the antibodies and it can lead to immune escape. So this is what we are worried about. And there could be possibly increased risk of reinfections. All these deletions and mutations, clinically, they can implica, imply that there could possibly be increased risk of reinfection. So let us look into this vaccine effectiveness against this. So when you look at this Covishield or CADOX-1, it was found to be 70% effective against the initial coronavirus that came. But its effectiveness came down to 10% for beta variant. For beta variant, studies have shown that the vaccine effectiveness dropped to 10%. And, but when you look at the BNT, which is the Pfizer, BNT162, efficacy was retained for both this initial virus and the beta variant. Okay, but what has been shown is, what has been shown is, although it can cause infections, all vaccines have been found to be effective in preventing hospitalization and death because the main reason was because of the good T cell response, because of the uh, T cell immune response or the memory cells have led to good protection, which prevents possible hospital admission and death. So this is what uh, all the listeners should bear in mind that all vaccines have been proven to be effective in beta variant, alpha variant and delta variant in reducing hospitalization and death. Do we have hard data? So there is hard data. So this was a study from Qatar, which came in NEJM 
looking at 231,000 patients, 2,31,826, uh, where they found vaccine efficacy was more than 90% effective in preventing hospitalization in the Delta variant. So we have a data to say all vaccines were effective in preventing hospitalization and death. So Delta variant, it was very effective. Then we have this uh, US data where we have um, 88 lakhs, 34,604 patients they have looked at, where they found that vaccine prevented severe disease in patients more than 65 years of age. And, uh, and there was 95% uh, effectiveness or efficacy with your Pfizer vaccine, 97% effectiveness with mRNA 1273, which is the Moderna, and 86% effective with Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So which means to say that vaccines are there to prevent severity of the disease in all the variants. So we possibly believe that even for the Omicron, vaccines may possibly help in preventing hospitalization and possible deaths because this is what has been shown with the data currently available with alpha variant, beta variant, and more so the delta and delta plus variant. These studies have shown that it reduces the risk of hospitalization, severity, and possible deaths. So the conclusions we could make is with Omicron, we understand there is a lot of deletions and mutations which create hurdles for antibody response or for antibodies to be effective. But what we realize is what is saving the lives is your memory cells and the uh, T cell response or the immune cells, which have been very protective in preventing hospitalizations and death. So the conclusions are for all the viewers in our country is good vaccination with all the public health measures will go a long way in vanquishing this so Omicron as well, even if it spreads in our country. So I will end with this nice video as to the efforts our Karnataka government is taking uh, to prevent, uh, to vaccinate our individuals. I hope it's not playing. Huh? Not sure why it's not playing. Okay, I think I, I wish I could have shown you this video. All right, I, I'll show you the next thing. So, so thank you all.